Hey, Shaka Bras, welcome to The Fireside. My name is Jake. Very excited to have you back here with me today. And I'm excited about this episode with my friend Russ Abbott. Russ, as you probably know, is a real pioneer in several ways in the tattoo industry. Early on, he was a pioneer of digital drawing and, and his 3D geometry work showed us the possibilities of, of using digital drawing as a tool. And this was well before people were drawing on iPads or using Procreate. And then, of course, Russ founded Tattoo Smart, which was one of the early digital stamp brush set toolkits for digital drawing. And so the funny thing about this episode is that it was not really intended to be a podcast. Russ and I tend to catch up every few months just to see what's happening in the world of Tattoo Smart and a Fireside. And he suggested that we record this call just in case something interesting came out of it. And of course it did. Anytime you're talking to Russ, you're going to get some interesting, interesting ideas. And so I'm happy that we did record it. I'm happy to share it with you here today. We talked about all sorts of things from managing online communities, trying to get people engaged, trying to be useful and valuable as tattoo educators to the tattoo community. We talked about building teams, working within our own kind of unique ability and finding who's to plug in to handle the tasks that we're not particularly good at. All kinds of stuff like that. So I really got a lot out of the conversation and I hope that you do too. Enjoy. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So what what's what's new? How's everything going with Launchpad? I try to I get the emails. I try to hop in occasionally, but I'm not as active as I'd like to be. I think there's not a lot of people that are as active as they'd like to be. That's pretty yeah. much the reality of a, a new community with less than we might not be less than 200, but we're right at that cusp of 200 people. I think it really gets exciting when we double that or even triple that. Yeah. I don't know what the yeah. official number is for when you know an online community really starts to gel, but. For now, it's just new to water the fields and make sure that we're showing people a great time who are there. And one of the ways we're doing that is trying to have weekly events, just conversations, even like the one we're having now, where I'll meet up with various people and, and talk about the tattoo business or talk about what's going on in their world. And we record those and we leave them up. So they're always going to be part of the library that anyone can access. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of gearing really nice. up to do a little bit more of that and trying not to get bogged down with too many different projects. But as it always goes, that's where we are. How about yourself? Uh, that Everything's going pretty well here. We've I've had a small group that I call the Inside Fireside Tattoo Club. And we've been doing that for a while, but it's really been focused. It's a Discord server and it's been focused on people who have bought Fireside courses and want a little feedback. So originally... When a course was first launched, there are two kind of flagship courses. When we first launched them, they were higher end courses and you automatically got access to this group and you could turn in assignments and I would critique and then other members would critique and try to help out. And I found that people were, for whatever reason, they were hesitant to use that group. So I'd never gotten any real feedback on the courses. Like I didn't know if people were getting through the modules, which was frustrating. I decided to take a different model and I've dropped the price of the courses where if you just want to buy the courses and go through them on their own, you know, they're $50 instead of $200 or whatever they are. And then, and then there's an upsell like, Hey, would you like one month of an inside fireside tattoo club with your course, 17 bucks for the first month. If you can get through your entire foundations course, you could actually turn in every module and get feedback for $17, pretty good deal. And then you would hopefully bite stick around for the other kind of stuff that we're doing and i'm trying to keep it drawing focused and tighten it but like you i'd like to i'd like to have more drink and draw nights or fun things or a reason to stick around after you've been through the course so that's just what we're i want to make it where it works well independent of the courses because up until now it's basically just been a way to get feedback on assignments from those courses we're playing around with that right now cool that's awesome yeah. we've that's also been trying to get people to start posting in Launchpad for critiques. And occasionally they do. And sometimes when they do, the responses that they get from our members are incredible. We've seen people take that person's artwork, pull it into a digital program and draw on top of it to try to illustrate the changes they were recommending. And I just love it when that happens. It's just incredible. Foster that and then get it to consistently happen because sometimes it'll happen and then Someone else will post something up and it's just crickets chirping. Like no one's commenting, no one's helping. And, and it's just a matter of scale, really, because someone has to see that post and have the time and the energy to respond to it. So there just have to be more people in a community to really get that going. And yeah. so that's one of the things that we're doing moving into 2023 is we're really changing the, I guess, the way that we think about whether someone is or is not qualified for Launchpad. I think at the very beginning, there was this idea that it was going to be all of expert level 
tattoo artists, people who were like really advanced in their career. And, and now we're rethinking all of that and we're saying, okay, let's try to open it up a little bit and see if we get some people that are in their first few years of tattooing who are really hungry for a community to come in here. And then maybe that will create, foster an environment where those experts have someone there that they can share that expertise with. Because I think there, there was a little bit of a feeling of everybody in here is fucking sick and you know, I don't feel comfortable critiquing them on, on matters of art. On the business side, we've seen a lot more interaction. We've seen a lot more studio owners who are looking for a place to really talk about the tattoo business and dig into the problems of studio ownership, leadership, all of that side of thing is really a big part of what I'm personally interested in talking about too. So it's, it seems to be driving in that direction, but trying to yeah. keep it broad enough for people to talk about anything as long as it's related to tattooing. Yeah. I would bet that whenever less experienced and more hungry artists, the more of those that get involved I would think the more that, that you would find the that kind of day-to-day -day activity or communication growing. I know our, and we don't have, I think there are maybe right now 40 some odd active members in our, our members in our, they're not active, like using it all the time. But whenever I look at the fireside members, there are like 40 something of them in that server. And there are about six or seven that I have actively reached out to and said, hey, let's try to do a drawing night on Friday. Let's try to knock it. We're going to do a monthly drawing challenge. And I want all six of you guys to jump in and do it for sure. Don't give me an excuse why you can't do the drawing challenge by the end of the month. And just to, to try to get a handful of people going. And the ones that are the most active, I can think of one in particular that's by far the most active, isn't even a tattooer yet. He's been trying to get an apprenticeship. He works on his portfolio like crazy. He posts in there like crazy. If anyone else posts, he writes paragraphs of ideas for them drops in like reference images to illustrate what he's talking about and he's just like he's hungry he just wants to be a part of tattooing and that's like man i wish i had 10 of you i would love to trade 10 tattooers 10 real like <laughs> 10 working tattooers for 10 of you that'd be awesome right <laughs> yeah working tattooers hearing that right now are probably thinking well i don't have time i'm busy working <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, it, yeah. It, i think there is something really nice about that that fresh young energy so hungry and excited to learn more and to really it's just there's so many challenges at the beginning and at, over time you just get stuck in your ways and get complacent and comfortable and i never stay that way but i do see a lot of other tattoo artists that just start coasting at some point and so we're really trying to yeah. stoke that fire build that energy and give people a place to connect with others like them Right. So it doesn't have to yeah. be a huge community. It just needs to be a community of people who really want to be there. And that's one of the reasons that we charge for it. Mm -hmm. Launchpad is $50 a month. And yeah. it gives us an opportunity because it's paid. It does generate a little bit of revenue. And then we can afford to hire the community manager, Forrest. And he's always there Seems just like making sure that everyone has a great time. And yeah. Uh, he seems like he's doing a great job. He's even grabbed a few of our videos over the last six months or so and posted them for us on the on Launchpad. So the Fireside put out a thing on color palettes. I thought it was good. I'm like, man, awesome, dude. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. There's always at least one person at Launchpad thinking about it every day. How can I make this great? How can mm -hmm. I keep pushing this along? And he's so awesome whenever someone new joins He'll reach out to them personally and just make sure that they have a nice onboarding experience. And if somebody has a question, he's the most likely person to know who in the community would know the answer to it. So he'll actually go back into the DMs and just sort of reach out to that person and say, hey, can you go answer this person's question? They're asking about something in your sphere of knowledge. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do with it. I think That's the vacuum so cleaners are getting closer and closer to me now. They still okay. sound distant. It's this mic bad, helps so. with that, hopefully, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not too bad. It sounds like a distant. I think they just quit. Yeah, anyways. they did. Now they're um, going to come into this room, though. They're right. Sneak around <laughs> Start sweeping right behind you. That That's one of those mindsets that we talk about a lot in Coach, or one of the kind of principles is this who, not how. And Dan Sullivan, along with this guy, Ben Hardy, who I've really gotten, I love his books. Yeah, uh, He too. wrote Willpower Doesn't Work. It's great. I haven't read that uh, one, but, but I have read the collab that he did called The Gap, in, the Gap and the Gain. Oh, The Gap and the Gain. Yo, I have yeah. that one. I haven't read it yeah. yet. It, was it good? It was really helpful for me. The whole book yeah. is just about, about the mindset of looking back 
at how far you've come. So looking mm -hmm. at the gain versus looking at the gap that exists between you and this sort of foggy yeah. dream that you have of what it's supposed to be like. And yeah. when I read that, I was like, oh, man, this is exactly right. Like I was totally stuck in that world where I could never really just sit with a sort of gratitude for everything that has gone right in my life and in my business. Instead, I just keep thinking like, got to keep moving forward, got to keep moving forward. And if you if you can just switch your mindset on that and look at the gain instead of the gap. And this is again, there's a whole book about it. But really, that's mm -hmm. the entire point. It's like right there on the cover of the book. It's just one idea that they just do a really great job of helping you understand. I'd like to hear Ben's t take on it. That is one of the fundamental kind of strategic coach principles. So the first year when you're learning those core, the entrepreneurial time system is first and then ga the gap mindset is the second or third workshop that you do is all focused on that. And it's something they come back to a lot. I love it. Like the idea of setting goals, looking forward, but measuring backwards. And I thought my coach is not Dan. It's a, someone that works under Dan. He pops up this photo of Matthew McConaughey jogging down the beach and he's like, a lot of us would probably like to have abs like Matthew McConaughey, but if you're like doing sit-ups every day with that poster on your wall and then measuring yourself against Matthew McConaughey's abs at the end of every sit-up session, like you'll quit. Now, there's no way you'll do it. He's like, you have to be looking at photos of yourself from last week. Mm -hmm. You can't look at the poster or the, the image right. of Matthew McConaughey going forward. It's such a simple way to think about it. So, yeah, man, that's absolutely right. That was one of those things that really, I say changed my mindset. What I've learned doing this, and I've been coached for probably six or eight years now, is I, we just go back to those things every single quarter. And it's not like you get it and then you just know it and it's a part of your life from there on out. It's like you get it, you know it, you lose it, it gets fuzzier and fuzzier. You forget about it all together and start focus, start doing exactly what you know not to do. And then it's reintroduced to you and at the next meeting and next workshop and you're like oh yeah i haven't been doing that at all i haven't <laughs> used that that tool at all and you just it's funny how yeah. like any of these guys are spending a lot of money to sit in these workshops to relearn the same that's what i was just thinking quarter. the thought that came to me was well, maybe you just needed to spend a little bit more they raised <laughs> the right. price doubled the price would you finally yeah. listen <laughs> maybe so i ask you because i'm in their signature program they have a, they have two programs that kind of ahead of me and i think the next one up is something like fifty thousand a year and then the next one up, up above that is a hundred thousand a year. And of course those guys can come and sit in on any workshop. So I'm often in workshops with people who are in the game changer program. We were paying a hundred grand a year. And I'm like, so what are they teaching you at the hundred thousand dollar level? And he was like, hey, we're doing the exact same things that you're doing. We're just doing them with the different people. It's like people who are people who have a hundred thousand dollars a year to put into this and they're yeah. just solving different problems than you are. So, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Is, tell me more. <laughs> I'm really just curious about what actually happens inside of strategic coach it's awesome it's you'll get a workbook through covid you would get a workbook in the mail a week or so in advance and then we were doing zoom meetings and i found that i wasn't a big fan of that because i would go through and prep myself for all the thinking exercises so i was more so i was ready to like not show off but like to so i would have something to contribute and i found that i didn't get as much out of the workshops doing it that way the way that it works in real life in non-pandemic times which we're back to now but only recently canada was way strict like we have we just recently been able to fly to canada and uh, so now you know you get there you get a workbook typically you get a, some type of a book if, like the new ben hardy dan sullivan book you'll always get something like that and you'll do a morning intro you'll go through the day and then they'll, your coach will present a concept, an idea. Maybe the gap is a good example. So maybe we'll give, do some gap thinking kind of ideas as a group. And there's say 25 people in our group. And then we break off into groups of three and there are little worksheets and we'll just do, I skipped a step. We'll do the exercise as a group. Are you good? Is that still, it's, is it too it's loud? It's really loud, but I can hear you. I <laughs> okay. just, I just it's, feel bad for you. It's still muffled. Yeah, okay. it's cool. It's still muffled for me. But so what will happen is you'll go through the exercise as an entire group with something on the board behind you. Then you'll take three to five minutes and you'll complete a worksheet, just a thinking exercise on your own. Then you'll break off into groups of three and spend five minutes each kind of presenting your ideas and being challenged by other members. And then you break away, maybe take a little break and come back to the next kind of exercise. So that's basically the format. But the way that they do it, they leave a lot of room for the entrepreneurs in the room to to organically start conversations. So we'll come back from those breakout sessions. So you've had 15 minutes with two other people to think, 
And then they'll come back and we'll say, okay, who got what from that breakaway? That was that good for anyone? And then someone's like, oh, you know what? I've been having this trouble with this. So recommended that I try this solution and I'm gonna give that a shot. I appreciate that. And then of course that starts a whole conversation with the entire room. And then the coach is willing to let that go on for 15 or 20 minutes a lot of times just to see what we want to explore together. So there's a very loose kind of schedule but if it starts to go in another direction, I mean, it's a lot of smart people. It starts to go in another direction, they just let it go, and then they'll reel it back in when they have to. But uh, So it's, other than these live workshops, are there any interactions that you're do, having yeah, weekly they, or they daily do. or anything like that? Yeah, they do weekly. You'll do calls with your kind of account rep in between every workshop. So you have one dedicated hour-long call. And then uh, they do weekly uh, calls where they'll have someone from another workshop in, and it's almost like an audio podcast kind of thing. So they do these kind of weekly, I forget what they call the, I guess they wouldn't mind me pulling it up and showing. Uh, I forget what they call their weekly sessions, but yeah, they have weekly sessions. They have all kinds of events that are happening all the time. I was going to see if I could pull it up and share the screen, but... Yeah, it's going to make me do all my login. Yeah, there's stuff that happens constantly that you that you can be a part of or that you can skip out on. I skip the weekly ones quite a bit, but I should be a bigger <laughs> part of them. But. Yeah. yeah. Is that your yeah. entire professional development stack or do you are you parts of other programs or do you have some other no, things going I, on? I spent about a year, maybe two years through COVID in Abundance 360, Peter Diamandis' group. Okay. Do you know that I'm, at all? No, I'm not familiar uh, with it. It's more focused on longevity. It's focused on technology and uh, entrepreneurs using technology to, to better the world. His tagline is the easiest way to become a billionaire is to help a billion people. So he's mm -hmm. got the, he's a real moonshot kind of a guy. Right. Like he founded the XPRIZE Foundation. Okay, I don't know if yeah. you've heard of XPRIZE. It's connected. Uh, yeah. yeah, he did a human longevity initiative where they took, I forget the scientist that sequenced the human, his entire genome or whatever. But <laughs> so he's partnered with that guy and they've started this project where you can go and spend an eight hour day out in San Diego and they'll tell you what cells they can remove today that will prevent cancer in five years that will likely be like, this is probably going to be pro a problem within the next three yeah. to five years. Let's go ahead and get rid of it while you're here. That kind of thing. <laughs> okay. So that's it. That's everything you're doing. Those and that in books and drawing yeah. pictures. Just yeah. all the books. What yeah. About, yeah. What about you? I don't know if I have told you, but I've got a program mm -hmm. called Tattoo MBA that's starting it's uh, first yeah. round of just 11 students are going to be a part of it. But we're starting that next week and it's a 12 week program. Nice. You said how many students? 11. Nice. So it's, this is really for studio owners or expert artists who are looking to figure out how to refine their business systems, marketing, customer journey, trying to teach some business skills that a lot of tattoo artists just haven't ever connected with. So it's, it's like a private space inside of Launchpad. They still get the access to Launchpad, but they have a space where they can have higher level business conversations. But right now I'm just fully focused on helping people to create a business for themselves that actually can sustain them and their family, provide income for them that is more than just what they need to, to pay the rent this week. So I think there's just a lot of opportunity for people to lead tattooing to a place where it's just a more holistic approach, right? Without losing what we all love about tattooing and the connection to our clients and all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I love seeing the way the folks who've come out of the gate as tattoo educators in the, in the information age, say over the last 15 or 20 years, and there were people who were doing it long before that. Someone like Guy was doing it through books and, and then he jumped in as well in, with the technological kind of age. And it's funny how people just seem to find their own way as, as time goes on. And when we first started Fireside, it'll be 10 years old this year. I couldn't find, the reason I started is because I couldn't find a tattoo podcast. I just didn't see one. I said, there was a guy in New York, the tattoo, I forget what he was called now, tattoo mentor or something like yeah, that. But that's Keith. He, uh, Keith, right. Yeah. So he had, he was before me, but he had only done a handful of audio episodes and then had fallen off and I couldn't find much. So when we started, I thought, well, I don't know exactly what this will be, but it'll be something tattoo related, shop talk, whatever. And then as other ones started coming along, I was hesitant to listen to a lot of them to begin with. I was hesitant to listen to people. And then of course, with clips and TikToks and all that, you get little snippets of what people are doing and right. saying. And you realize like, 
everyone's doing their own thing. No one's mimicking Fireside. If you listen to, to Matt Klimmer, if you listen to, I haven't listened to a lot of their full episodes, but the clips that they're playing, they're completely lifestyle and and quality of life based. They have nothing to do with drawing pictures. If I, if I listen to the, that tattoo guy or any of the other ones, they're, they're all doing different things. Yeah. And it's cool to see how we've how people have found their own way. And you feel like it was going to be a really competitive environment, but yeah. I haven't found that to be true at Not all. Not at all. You're right. When you really start to look at how leaders have popped up in other fields that are much larger than tattooing, you can see that there's so much more room for so many more people to get out there and create content that's unique and valuable and that there's going to be an audience for. So it's so new for tattooing. And so we think, oh, there's already five people doing, how could there possibly be any more? But just wait 10 years from now when there's 5,000 people doing it and you'll <laughs> wonder, how did we ever get here? But it's just inevitable that's what's going to happen. And it's that abundance it, mindset that once right. you unlock that, you no longer get clammed up and worried about trying to protect what you think is yours and you collaborate and you create opportunities right. to work with other people who are on the same mission that you're on. I'm, I don't know that I know exactly what your mission statement is, but I guess it has something to do with wanting to carry tattooing forward, wanting to leave tattooing better than you found it and just right. trying to solve the problems that you've had along your journey so that other people don't have to have them as more so that more awesome tattoos can be done and less terrible tattoos can be done and we all sing kumbaya yeah. and it's the world's a happy place <laughs> right. and yeah that about I mean, right it, this that's about right yeah yeah, yeah. I, I love the idea of and i don't want to go to get too far into this because i had another thought but i love the idea of of that everyone has a unique mark and one thing that i've noticed over almost 30, 27 years of tattooing now is is it's a very much a copycat industry. When something starts to trend, everyone's trying to steal tricks and steal tricks. And, and what I think really pushes us forward is people having the confidence in their own marks. And of course you have to train those marks to a certain extent. And so it's less about techniques, it's less about all that. It's more about principle-based problem solving and then being able to trust your own unique mark, trust your version of what that cool trick is. What, what is that trick and how do I break it down into principles? Is that a shape? problem they were solving? Is it an edge problem they were solving? What does it have? To, what category does it fall in? What principle does it fall under? And then what could I do that's unique to my mark making? And I think that's what pushes us forward artistically more than anything. And if there's any hang up in tattooing that I just always, and I'm not an Instagram scroller too much, but whenever I am on social media, I'm like, I can look at beginning tattooers or people who follow Fireside that will follow back. And I'm like, I know exactly who they're looking at and what trick, what trend they're trying to follow right there. It's a woman in, in her head and she has a bun in her hair and, and her face is a landscape instead of a face or something like that. And it's like, I've seen that a thousand times and it's been done the same way a thousand times. You could make that your own. You could make it cool, mm. but you didn't. But but with it, uh, That's an but interesting what, perspective. I don't know that I share the exact same view on it that you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. We come from different places. Yeah. You're also making stamp sets. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, yeah. That, you, yeah. Right. Yeah. If I could, if I could just speak to the other side of it, then sure. the way I look at it is each of those, those iconic flash designs there. Well, let's look at it a different way for any tattoo image. There's an ideal, right? If you put all the heads in the room and you got the smartest AI to look at it, we could somehow come up with, this is the perfect, you know, oh, everything was done right by the book. And when you are new to tattooing, you've never seen that book, right? You just, you don't even know what page it's on and you do need a model to follow. So the idea of why we make stamp sets, why we go to tattoo artists who have really focused on a specific style and a specific type of imagery and we have them create, say, 50 different versions of the same subject matter is because we are trying to capture that we're trying to give someone in anyone in the future something to start with that they can then add their voice to and it's not the whole picture right i think that they need to if we're talking about a tattoo of a tiger for example right they would need to look at photos of tigers they need to look at possibly paintings of tigers this is only a piece of it but i've always found that my artwork looked much better when before I even made it, I collected three different references. So that's always been a rule for me that, that anytime I break it, I always regret it. Unless it's something I'm really familiar with drawing, like scroll work, for example. But anything else, if it's a person, place, or thing, 
that I'm trying to illustrate, I'm going to gather some sort of reference material, images off of Google, pictures from books, stamps from a flash set, whatever yeah. it takes to get those things together. Because for me, like the part that I'm going to add to it is that little subtlety, that little shift away from the ideal or just a different mixture. I'm actually just trying to construct something that has a great value structure. You know, I'm just trying to solve all the all of the, the rules that I know about what makes a tattoo work really well mm -hmm. and just go around in circles on the design and solve each of those everywhere that I can. And yeah. I feel like I'm there's not a lot of me that is like an expressive mark maker in my art. Does that make sense? So that might be why I'm drawn yeah. to all those precise geometric designs where I'm just like focusing on the craft of tattooing, just like filling that little weird triangle shape in exactly the right, right color and moving on so yeah that worked really well yeah <laughs> no i think we're i think we're probably more on the same page than it sounds like and i may not have done a great job describing it but i was I certainly don't think people should draw without reference but i think that whenever let's say back to that to the head with the landscape face or whatever there's nothing if someone wants that tattoo there's certainly nothing wrong with repeating that tattoo but if you can take those rules the rule book that you're talking about and i can say okay like what in this layout to me is going to be the most important part. If I get to pick three things I want the viewer to pay attention to, what are they going to be? And then how do I use the area of the body that I'm putting it on? So how do I take that shape, the one shape that I can't control, right? That this is the, this is where the client wants it. That's the first shape. I have no say over that shape. Whatever tattoos frame that shape in, that is what it is. And then I say, okay, so this head and the hair and whatever, like how do I arrange those shapes? to fit best within this shape. And right. within that, where do I want attention to go? Then that's where I can use my value, my strongest yeah. contrast in that area, push harder edges in that area. Yeah. So I think we're talking about the same thing. Exact same thing, yeah. yeah. This is exactly how I would explain it. And I love those constraints, yeah. right? I'm so much more comfortable starting with something from the client. It's gotta go on this body part. It's gotta include this subject matter. Without those, mm -hmm. I'm completely clueless. I don't know what's all of a sudden yeah. a sunbeam has just found this one little Man, spot I'm, and has landed on my chest and it's driving me crazy. I'm so glad it hit you first. <laughs> I have, we're about to hit a point where I just turn into like a glowing <laughs> silhouette. <laughs> it's just in a couple of minutes here. But what I was going to say though, leading up to that, we were talking oh, about all the different roles that people, that people fill. And it goes back to what you were talking about with Forrest being such a great manager for the Launchpad community. One of the big coach kind of mindsets or thinking exercises that we've been working on and that the the higher end programs their hundred thousand dollar program really focus on their their industry changer program who not how is the mindset and it's strategic mm -hmm. partnerships so it's like I, I am not a social media person i dive into what i dive into and i'll forget like this discord community of ours for example i'll try to hold everyone accountable to be a part of it and to show up every day and to this and then i'll disappear for a week because i get into something else i'm not the who to manage an online community. Yeah. I need a who for that. Someone's online all day, every day, and I'm trying to identify that person. Yeah. And I think that- You already that, do know the person you just described them. They're that person who isn't tattooing yet, who's always in there driving right. your community. And I've read Who Not How. The nice thing about apparently everything with Strategic Coach is that you can just go read a book about it, or you can pay $100,000 <laughs> to have them tell you about it. It's weird, but- I'm learning that. <laughs> I'm learning that I, yeah, I recently <laughs> read, I didn't even have to read the book. I got the audio book and man, I wish I had that mm. years ago because from now on, we're definitely going to be following that model, right? We're going to be looking for how can we hire absolute A players who are really ideally suited for the specific role that we're hiring for. In the past, I've just said, who who in my sphere have I run into who seems smart and what job can I match them up with? And it's worked out okay, but mm -hmm. other times we've had to continue moving people around into different places to try to figure out what they're going to do because we love them and we want to keep working with them, but for whatever reason, they're not ideally suited for the thing that we thought we, and that we, and one of the problems of course, is it's proceeding without having a very clear understanding of why or what you're even trying to accomplish. I, I think that you just described a who in your community. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a matter of whether or not that actually makes sense. And if you can clearly define what it is that you would like the, them to do, I see no reason why a person who is not yet tattooing Forrest doesn't tattoo. He's a tattoo collector. He got right. tattooed by me and I could just see that he was just 
had a nice ease of navigating the tattoo community. And he was sitting there getting tattooed by me. And it, I, it actually goes back to a time where you and I had a conversation. It must have been two years ago now where we were talking about tattoo influencers. We we're talking about how can we tattoo smart needed to connect with for marketing purposes. We needed to get better at having people use our products and show us how they were using them and make those posts on their social media of using the products. And I was learning about how influencer marketing is managed for bigger brands by agencies. And we were thinking about, I oh, mean, should we pay an agency to go out there and find a bunch of tattoo influencers and give them our product and get them to make content? And that just seemed like a fucking terrible idea because yeah. how would we know that the agency would pick influencers that would be a good fit for our brand. They might just go out and find just anybody. And all of a sudden that anybody would be making stuff about our brand that wasn't a nice connection to our actual brand. So we were thinking like, we have to find our own person to go out and do that. So that was Forrest's original job. Oh, and we okay. played around with that, that for a little while and just morphed away from it. We didn't have the best success with achieving it as we were trying to like create systems to go out and find people and interact with them and get them to actually do the thing. And I'm not saying that we're not going to try again and that we're not still trying to solve it other ways, but we still, we thought Forrest was still an awesome employee and we wanted to find some great use of his talents. It started to match up with having him be a part of managing Launchpad and he's really taken to it. He's a member of a community management community now. So he gets, he goes there to connect with the experts over there and the other people who are managing communities. So just like he's the manager of Launchpad, he's over in a different version of that, learning about his craft and his he's developing himself. And that's been a theme around for me lately, just hiring experts to consult with us for whatever problems we're trying to solve. You don't always have to hire someone on your and have them be an employee forever. Sometimes you can just hire someone for an hour and understanding that and knowing how to do it has been an absolute game changer for me over these last five years or so. Yeah, it's become so easy with whether it's hiring freelancers, virtual assistants, the people who, who are good at different things and just hiring them on a project basis or, mm -hmm. or whatever. I just recently, had, you'll shake your head at this, but I just recently stopped editing our videos. I had one of my early guys, Scott, that edited videos for us for a long time and he did a good job. And then he bought a small business and it's been busy. And so I started editing and I guess for whatever reason, I trusted Scott with, with how I came across on video, but I was very hesitant to trust these professional video editors who do this all day, every day online. And uh, I just, I had it, I had a wall up. I wasn't going to let it happen. And so recently I've just, I'm, I realized that I'm in that rugged individualist mindset with that. If I want it done right, I'll do it myself. And I thought, okay, mm -hmm. I have to ditch that. Yeah. I'm going to get rid of the video editing. And I've done that and it hasn't been great so far, but I realized the problem isn't that they don't know how to edit. The problem is in my communication with them. Exactly. So now I need to work on that piece of it. You don't you know, know how to delegate. <laughs> I've right. had the exact yeah. same yeah. problem. You just imagine that, that the people you're going to work with have some sort of superpowers and they really would just benefit from you becoming better at creating a creative brief. And this is something that you're going to need to be able to build once and then add to over time and improve. But I've been working on this myself and hundred percent, okay. like you, yeah. you will blow through so much time back and forth with those video editors that you would never have to even endure if you could figure out how to communicate very clearly from the beginning and give them all of the assets that they need and none of the assets that they don't need. Because part of the problem has been for us when we were trying, we're not doing this right now, but we had a, a Filipino fractional video editing firm that we hired for a couple of months. And we had very few outputs come out of the other end of that that ever made it to the light of day because it was just like, <laughs> it was just a lesson, a learning experience. But I guess you're, you're learning to solve those problems right now. There's a really great, there's an entrepreneur in my coach group who has a great delegation kind of system. And he, he has a D one through D three. So whenever he has something on his desk, he's in a, he's in a traditional business finance, I think accounting. And so he'll write whenever he puts something in his outbox for his assistant, he'll write 
D1 means research this, bring me back what you find, and I'll make a decision. D2, take care of it and report back to me on what you did. And D3 means I don't care what happens with this. Don't ever show it to me again. Just get it off of my desk. And so that's <laughs> the levels of delegation that he has. So his team has an expectation of what type of delegation they're doing. And they're not wasting a lot of time on something that he couldn't care less about. Damn, so, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I did too. I did too. Yeah, that who not how mindset has been a real game changer for me. And it's funny how easy it is once you start to look for who's. Do you ever use, do you use any of the, like the Colby or the Briggs Meyer, any of the personality type of tests for your team to see what their tendencies are? I haven't tried that yet. I definitely want to. How, yeah. What about you? you? We have to do Colby's in coach. And then they want you to have your key team members do Colby's. And so back whenever I joined coach, they're called, I sorry, they're called Colby's. How do you spell that? Uh, K-O-L-B-E is the one that strategic coach uses. And, okay. uh, and uh, so the woman who invented it, her name is Kathy Colby. And she's a, she's super, super smart. You can watch interviews with her on YouTube. But so I did one for myself. And then I did, and then I had my wife do one because she, you know, we have a real estate business as well, and she runs the day to day of the real estate business. And so I, the two of us are the only ones who have done it. As Fireside is growing, I have not done it with any team members yet. But it, but as people become more and more involved, I think that I will. I think that what it really does is it allows you to to basically find people who have different skill sets than yourself or different tendencies than you, and literally just create roles for them. There are things that need to be done. Like you were saying earlier, like you have to move people around. You, know, you hire someone, they're a decent fit, and you're trying to move them here to find what they could do better because you like them and you want them. To, maybe they're not good at this, but they are good at this. I think it simplifies that process a lot. It helps you to kind of wow. design roles for people. Hey, thanks again for taking the time to watch. I hope you got something out of that episode. I mentioned our new group, the Inside Fireside Tattoo Club, which is still in its beta testing infancy phase. But if you'd like to learn more about it, I will leave a link here in the end screen and uh, you can check it out and give me a shout if you have any questions. Thanks again for supporting what we do and I'll catch you the next time.